He was an author, a great broadcaster, professor, Episcopal deacon, and a friend. Ian Punnett first began occasionally hosting Coast to Coast AM in 1998. Then back in April of 2000, Ian became the regular weekend host. And then in December of 2001, he left Coast to Coast to do mornings in Minneapolis with his wife, Marjorie. He then returned to Coast to Coast AM in June of 2005, and in his spare time, he enjoyed writing, playing tennis, traveling, and doing things that involved being around water. He was one heck of a guy. He passed away several weeks ago, as you well know, at the age of 63. In a moment, Ian's wife Marjorie joins us as we begin a special tribute show to Ian Punnett. And welcome back to our tribute show for Ian Punnett. Ian met his wife, Marjorie, while the two were working at the Daily Illini at the University of Illinois. They had been married for 38 years, and she's on the line with us here as our beginning part of our tribute. Marjorie, I don't know what to say. Well, it's, there are, are no you? words. Uh, it is, um, we are sad, and we miss him, and I'm just want to say I'm so grateful to you and to all the lovely people who have said such wonderful things about him. It, it is, um, we, we talk about here that it, we feel like there's been just an avalanche of kindness and love that's come to our family. So thank you for that. You used to call me up. God, this is tough. It is, um, I just, um, I told myself I was going to be really strong for this segment. and uh... Well, George, you have to know how much he loved doing the show and how grateful he was to you. Um, and so I'm just very grateful to you tonight for just even thinking of him. Absolutely. He's one of, one of a kind, Marge. We'll never forget him. <laughs> he was. He was. And I, I am so grateful to the many stories that are coming out. People are texting me stories and old friends are calling me with stories. And um, it is, it is such a, a sweet thing to know that I shared a life with somebody who was good. Absolutely. Well, sit back and enjoy Marge. What you're about to hear is some segments of the life of Ian Punnett. This one begins with me interviewing Ian, which we did a couple of years ago. Listen in. Well, we're back right now waiting for Ian to show up on us. He's uh, left us in more than uh, several ways. And uh, let me go back to you again, Marge, if we can. Oh, we try to get this tape going. Of course. Ian's playing games with us, isn't he? <laughs> he, he, he was a practical guy, too. Practical jokester, wasn't he? Well, he certainly, um, his favorite time was uh, April Fool's Day when we were on the air together doing the show. And every year he would get me. And that, <laughs> that I like to think that I'm pretty sharp. Um, he just had to work harder every year to, to pull some great April Fool's joke. But yes, he, uh, he, loved to, he loved to do that. He loved to make people laugh. Um, he, he definitely was, uh, he, he was... Uh, he was very playful. No, he was one of a kind, Marge. He really was. Yeah. Uh, and anyways, um, we'll get this tape going pretty soon and uh, let no, you listen in. It's, um, okay, thanks, Marge. And here we are with the Punnett. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. Let me tell you about our senior member of Coast to Coast, Ian Punnett. Spent the majority <laughs> of his life on the radio, in school, in church. He worked for radio stations around the country. He's been one of the hosts of Coast to Coast AM since the beginning of time. He received his Master's of Divinity degree from Columbia Theological Seminary in Atlanta. He is a deacon in the Episcopal Church and completed his Ph.D. Congratulations in 2017 from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Ian Punnett on Coast to Coast. Hello, my friend. How are you? I just love that. The senior mm. member. I am, and that's so funny. I am doing so well. Can I tell you a quick story? Yeah. Absolutely. This so is your you, half hour. No, you mentioned, first of all, when I listen to this, I always think, oh, I should be doing this show better. I listened to your first segment. I'm like, I should I should really be doing this much better than I do. Uh, but the, so you sound great. Thank you. 
the you mentioned you know getting the bullion right and putting it in your safe at home so i i tell you the story cuz it's true and anybody can verify this there was a period of time when the idea of having a common safe, like a, a safe that you could just purchase, a small safe that you would have in your home mm-hmm. was unheard of because it, it, safes were something that you would see like at a bank or in a business. My great, great uncle um, founded the Punnett Safe Company. Really? To, yeah, yeah. To fill this market. And so they made, they were the first as I understand it, and you know how families go, you know, sometimes stories get exaggerated, but as far as I know, they were the first national uh, manufacturer and marketer of home safes. Now, it, that was a great idea, and I come from a family of inventors, and, and this is just one of many different things that they patented, but my great-great-uncle uh, was, in, was not a very good businessman. The company went bankrupt as the Punnett Safe Company, his partner bought it out. And to this day, you can buy a Sentry Safe. So you, if you, anytime you see a Sentry Safe spelled with an S, like you see them in Walmart. I mean, Sentry Safes are everywhere. That was originally the Punnett Safe Company. That's fantastic. What a great yeah. story. How it, long have you been associated with Coast to Coast now, Ian? Uh, it's, uh, since 2000, well, really since 2000 or 1999, uh, we have been unable to determine the actual date, of the, I think, of the very first show because I filled in a couple of times and then I became a regular. But let's just call it 2000. I so, remember yeah. back in April of 2001, Alan yeah. Corbett called me, who was heading yeah. up the company at the time, coast to coast. And he said, Ian's taking off a Sunday, George. Right. And we've heard about you in St. Louis. Would you do the show? And I went, ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Like, who would say no? <laughs> He's like, I don't, I don't think so. It's too late. Can I record it? That's the. Uh, right, can no, I? But you, you, I have watched. You know what's fascinating? Knowing you all these years, yes, sir, is watching your ability to flex, to change, and to do the many things Thank you did you. from from Minneapolis with you yeah. and your wife on the air, right, to where you are today, to coast to coast, and right. I mean, now you've got a PhD. You're a deacon. You're doing it all. I love well, it. Thank you, and I, I so I hear I teach in in Manhattan, Kansas at uh, uh, at Kansas State University, and yeah, I've got all these uh, fancy degrees, and I still can't find my car keys. I mean, I'm like, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm seriously, I was just up about ten minutes ago, and where I, I could, I could, and I have to drive in the morning. I thought I cannot find my keys. So there's, you know what? Thank you. And there's something about coast to coast which I don't think everybody takes advantage of over the years, and I know that. The, the like the people you've spoken with already understand the value of this show, this wonderful show, and this opportunity that you give us all. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that because you do all the heavy lifting. Is that it's up to us to make the most of it. it it's never. This is not a. You know, there are so many guests who come on, and you look at the met, the many fabulous careers that they've had. And I like to be like. I want to be in that category as somebody who's who does coast to coast, but also publishes books, also writes articles, also appears on TV, also does these other things. And coast to coast is just a, a marvelous home base. Well, you have always brought a very fascinating perspective oh, to the program. Thank and, you. And with with the things, and you're you're an author too. You've got. One book out, How to Pray When You're Beep at God. <laughs> you were always nice to promote that, yes. And you've got an NBA. Can they get the, your books on Amazon? Yeah, I think everything's still available, even if it's on the secondary market. And a lot of the last couple of books have been academic books, but I really enjoyed um, the book. We had a book called Moving Sounds that I did with my uh, partner, Phyllis West Johnson, who, and she was the senior editor, but I contributed a lot of the chapters, and, and we edited it, and it's all about the history of car radio and how radio changed cars and how cars changed how radio had been working, and that we wouldn't be, neither of us would be sitting here having this conversation if they hadn't figured out a way to put cars um, in such a place that they could accept a radio in the dashboard That's and right. that radios were programmed to really speak to people who were in cars. 
And this is what changed radio in the 1950s. If had they not managed that, you know, radio would have just become one of those things that you read about in the history books. And then the other thing is, we have this new book out about the about the future of journalism. Um, I had a minor role in that book, but it's still a, a cool book that speculates about what journalism is going to be like in the year uh, 2050. And your PhD is in journalism. It's, yeah, it is. Yeah, journalism and mass communication. And so I, I kind of, you know, I like journalism. You love journalism, I know. How many years did you practice journalism in the formal sense? I've never stopped, Ian. I started okay. when I was 19 professionally. Right. And I've never stopped. Well, so I don't, I don't you don't have to put a, an actual date on that, but... The the what you've done then is the kind of thing that we talk about with students, which is you bring a journalistic sensibility to the exploration of these topics and asking questions and trying to find reasonably what could be a, at least a temporary answer. And then you continue to find out what really are the facts that that is the pursuit of journalism is always going to be the pursuit of facts. Um, and that's what you do. And so when you think about it, you've done it for decades, uh, I have, I like to push it a little bit on the communications end, and, and now I'm doing new innovative things where I make videos with students and, and a lot of social media with students, and I run the local campus radio station here on uh, at Kansas State. We are the longest continuously running FM college radio station in the country. That's fantastic. They're Over lining 70 up. Years. They're lining up to uh, talk to you. Let's take a few calls while All you're right. here. Wayne in Tacoma, welcome to the program. Wayne, you're on with Ian Punnett. Go ahead. Good evening, Sir George and uh, Deacon Punnett. How are you doing tonight? <laughs> I'm doing great. And how are you tonight? Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I've got a kind of a FYI and uh, a comment and a question. Sure. Uh, the FYI is on the Century Safe. Yeah. Uh, if you have an electronic one, they can be opened by a very large magnet. Oh, I've heard about this. Ones. Yeah, I've heard about this. Yeah, that it, this is a, uh, and I, 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 look, I don't have it, but I do. Ha- other than having a letter from the company, which recognizes my great great uncle's contribution, um, I don't really know a lot about them or how they work. But I've heard that. And what's your question yeah, and, there, Will? Uh, the comment, uh, you've had some very curious guests on. Uh, what's <laughs> Stormy Daniels, that lady from the Luciferic Church, the uh, what, Satanic Church of California? Yeah, the, 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 like that. Right, she was, and, in the, uh, she was in the inner circle uh, of Anton LaVey, yep. Yeah, right. And um, I, I'm... Uh, and and then you had a, this truck driver on the other other night that had a really kind of interesting UFO story, and you were giving him the BS meter all along the way. <laughs> I could kind of tell, but it was really interesting, and it probably Good. Would be the next best thing I've heard since Mel Mel Hall. Uh, well, we didn't. We the story just went on and on and on, and we just didn't have the time to to get it all there. So if it, that's the problem, of course, is when you do open lines. We still have to hit the brakes, you know, and, and that one, that story went for quite a while. And it, then there was another chat. And he just, we never got to the ending of the story, but that wasn't me. That was kind of up to him. We had, we had given him, and we tried to give everybody the chance to get to the end of the story before we have to get to the next caller. And he just, uh, he, he kept going, if that's what you mean. And the calls keep on coming, Ian, don't they? Yeah. Oh and that's God. the beauty of it. And I think that, you know, to mention Stormy Daniels. Uh, or the woman that we had had on who was originally a caller um, who listens to the show all the time, who was with Anton LaVey um, in the Black House in uh, San Francisco. I think one of the ways that this show has always um, conducted itself is to be respectful of people, even if you, even if in this case – they are on the edge of something uh, like a different religion. In the case of Stormy Daniels, we were talking about her trial and the fact that she was really being tried for being a witch, which is really kind of weird, you know, that that, it, that still kind of goes on. And unfortunately, she won the case, and the guy, she'll never see that money again, but the, the attempt to sort of just brand her a witch and then take her money just didn't fly with the judge or the jury. 
Uh, and I think that's what we do all the time is try to show respect to people while they're telling their story. But at the same time, we, we have to move along eventually. And I, I hope that callers can appreciate that. I told our Canadian friend and host, Richard Serrett, who was on right before you, that I yep. would ask you this question. Oh, you really want to eat Canadians? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that was just that's just the timing that we need to get away. And so I, I was like, <laughs> we just need them to eat the Canadians first so that we have a, the stalling. What eventually we could all turn into pet food for the invading alien army. So I say that's what I say. Let's go to Jill, Santa Barbara, California. Welcome to the program. Hi, Jill. Yes, hello there, George. Hello there, Ian. Morning. I do have a comment, and then I have a very small question. The comment is that I would just love it, and I'm sure thousands of people and more would love it, if you could do a show on your aunt and all the, not all of the research, but a great deal of the research that she did. And I had actually studied with Dr. Viola Neal. Yeah, that was her partner, the, sure. Yeah, so some of the metaphysical uh, work that Dr. Neal did, and it was fascinating. Unfortunately, I never got to meet your aunt, but I would just love it if there was a way to cover some of that fascinating. You know, she's just way before her time, as you well know, and yep. that book. I'd like to do a shout out about it. it is out of print, but I find prints of it quite often available somehow. The Breakthrough to Creativity was such a marvelous book. She was way ahead of her time, as you said, Jill. Way ahead of her time. And so if you could ever think of anybody or multiple people that could do some kind of a show on her, two of you could be the ringleader uh, to get that started. <laughs> I, I'd like yeah, to know yeah. more about this woman. Tell, tell me real quickly about your aunt. Her name is Dr. Shafika Karegula, and she died. She got electrocuted listening. What? You won't believe this. She's, what? She was in the tub listening I... to the radio, Yeah. and the radio fell into the tub. Oh, no. She she got electrocuted. Thank God she wasn't listening to us yeah, really? on the program. That oh, would have no. been horrible. But, well, how did she distinguish herself? But that... She was a psychiatrist who devoted right. her entire practice to investigating telepathy. Oh, and, interesting. In the ESP. And she just devoted her entire career. She wrote a couple books on it and uh, was really way out above the crowd. And then she passed on. Oh, interesting. And when she mentioned you know your aunt and i was i didn't know she meant my aunt and because i have an aunt who is about 90 and she is an author too not nearly what you're doing but she his, does historical work she and her husband who is my my uncle wonderful guy they both worked on books about the early years of uh race of uh form of uh stock car racing jeez that was and, cool yeah, and so they they went because they used to do that on the on the beaches in Daytona, and so the history of Daytona Beach and why it's there is originally they raced on the sand, and so she did a book about the early days of those racers on the sand, which is fabulous, and then they also did a book on the uh, early pilots who used to fly down from New York and land on the beaches in Florida because there were no runways yet. And so they knew which beaches to go to. And, and that's another reason why Daytona became so famous. Ian, where were you born? I was born in Wilmette, Illinois. I was born in my house, 234 Central Park. In a house? In a house. My mother was an early believer in home birth delivery and so we were i was delivered by a doctor who was retired from formal practice but he was still acting in this way what today we might call a midwife uh and so he was he delivered me in my house on the floor in my house in in Wilmette i've got about 45 seconds for you to sing your goodbye song to us well you're very kind and I, all this just started because i want to audition for the uh for your live shows george nori live so uh you know if you if you want to i uh, someday somebody else can't just remember the loveliness of paris seems somehow sadly gay the glory that was rome is of another day
And welcome back to Coast to Coast, George Norrie, our special tribute show to Ian Punnett. Producer Tom Danheiser worked with uh, Ian whenever Ian filled in for me or on some special shows on weekends. He was quite a guy, Tommy. He sure was. I miss that guy so much. And one of the memories I have is our, our every time I did work with him, we talked during the day. And he was so excited for the show to come up. He just, you know, he'd do all the music and we'd talk about anything you need. And he was just very, very excited. He sure was. And one of the things Ian just loved to do during his shows is talk about and interview musicians like the Cows Hills. We are blessed to have um, more than one. Um, I will tell you that I have learned a lot about this band from the documentary, A Family Band, and I'm like super geeked um, to have on all of the members of the Cowsills, which uh, still tour as the Cowsills, um, but I'll be focusing on Susan. I- I'll just tell you up front, you know, it's a 10-year-old crush. It'll never go away. On Coast to Coast AM, this is Ian Punnett. If you do watch A Family Band on Amazon Prime, it's free right now. If you do, then you'll see that it is both a documentary about the triumph of putting together this uh, unique sound that started originally with the brothers Bill, Bob, Barry, and John Cowsill, and then also a story of uh, tragedy. Um, and and what they had to do, survival even, of what they had to do um, to continue to thrive first as human beings and then later on as an ongoing music act. And, and so it is that I'm so happy to say that it's kind of a culmination of a weird kind of dream. Uh, uh, Bob, uh, Paul, and Susan Cowsill join us on tour from, well, whereabouts are you? Staten Island. We're leaving Staten Island, headed to Northampton, Massachusetts, for a show tomorrow. We're on a tour right now, and we're going coast to coast. <laughs> oh, I love that. Well, good. Well, I think we're going to go with you. Uh, and originally from Newport, Rhode Island, but not necessarily a place that you go back to a lot anymore, or do you still consider that to be home in a way? Oh, uh, well, we, hi, hi, Ian. I'm this Susan. Hi, Susan. And yeah, hi, home, Susan. we go home a lot, actually. Um, we have friends and family there. I think we're there at least a couple of times a year. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is that to visit Auntie Flo and Auntie Jean? Yes. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, Ian, God rest their souls, they have passed. Have they? We have did they? enjoy their, their spots on our movie, and we all, the whole family, uh, including our extended cousins, felt that Auntie Jean and Auntie Flo should have their own TV show. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. No, I really like, and they were such unique characters in the documentary and very candid, and they yeah, kind of yeah. like, they were almost like twit. I mean, they like finished each other's sentences, yeah. right? You know, the bro- yeah, the, the, those girls, the, that family was pretty tight, and those ladies were hilarious. Yeah. Beautiful women. We love those girls. Those are our aunties. Uh, Mom. Yeah. I liked how Auntie Jean sat like a man. That was my favorite. She like... Well, there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she, she owned that moment. She was there. She was... Um, so, uh, uh, you know, Bob, you are the longest member surviving of the touring group, obviously, because Paul and Susan come on just a little bit later on. Uh, and and part of the tragedy of the Cowsills are the ones that you've lost along the way. Uh, Billy being, you know, fundamental to the band's early success. Uh, and then Barry, who is very talented in and of his own right. Um, and then, of course, um, you've had... Uh, other aspects of your life that were very challenging that are addressed. I kind of feel like we need to talk about them because in some ways your, your showbiz success is unlikely because a lot of people who grew up with that type in that type of household would have found it very hard uh, to stay together for as long as, as you all have. Yes, that's, that's true, Ian. The, the challenge in the family was to survive so that the business could survive. And because when you start at such a young age, I mean, we started this while we were in high school and grade school, and our dad was a Navy uh, product of 20 years in the Navy and, and basically took it uh, all the way to the top for us. 
he really did no way or the highway this whole thing. Now, once you get up there, you got to get smart, and uh, that's where his way didn't work anymore. No. And we went kind of down because of it also. So it was a big challenge to navigate all that. Now, that's Bob, because I know, because I've heard the, read the, seen the documentary like 10 times. Yeah, well, he's famous. He's like our Wonder Years narrator, dude. <laughs> well, yeah. Listen, and, and, you know, I'm glad to know that the documentary has finally reached the status of being free. So that's really – that was great. Well, but you still have to pay extra for the uh, for the little um, – for some of the interstitials and the, some of the features. You still pay two ninety nine if you want to watch those. That, that thing took years to make because, you know, when you go into a project like that, you're not – really familiar with what's going to happen and it becomes a big psychiatric session for years yeah and, and, and you you're, you're willing to give up the information you're willing to lay it all out and that's what you have to get used to when you're making a documentary we even shut it down for two years it was like crazy uh, but we're glad we finished it and thanks to louise belanker who directed it and came yeah, up with that easy. idea easy. and uh we were real thrilled to share that story ultimately well, it's great. And I want to share some other things um, from each of you tonight in, in the two hours that we have you as you're driving. And if we if something drops or you, you, we have a problem, please make sure you call back because I just have so many questions. And and it comes out of being a fan for many years. Um, and in fact, I'm even fans of things that I get the impression that you all are not fans of in your careers. So, uh, yeah. Well, like, because Billy was... Billy was talking down Indian Lake, which I happen to think is an amazing pop song. Well, well Ian, you didn't hear the demo that we got of Indian Lake. Now, what we did to it. But, but Ian, I, I do want to say that uh, Billy did feel like that until Brian Wilson told Bill that he loved that song. Oh, really? Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Well, I yeah, love it, too. Love that was too. That's Paul, by the way, who's the snarkiest yeah. member of the family, according to the, the documentary. <laughs> <laughs> we always knew we had to pay the fiddler, and so we just wanted to have fun, enough fun to warrant paying the fiddler. Yeah. It was, so I, let's, I want to talk about one thing. I'll just let's, I think this is really interesting because I, I, I work with a lot of people who are adult children of alcoholics, and there are things about the documentary which resonates with them because of what they went through. And especially, Bob, you refer to so often the, the sort of group silence that you all had maintaining the family secret, except it seems for Paul, who seemed to be, at least by some of the clips I've seen, kind of the family truth teller from an early age. Is that wrong? Yeah, it works. This is Paul, Ian, and uh, yeah, I always kind of, Said what was on my mind. Yeah. <laughs> he got to cause him a lot of trouble. <laughs> but, you know, Polly really was the kind of, and it's funny because he was the middle guy, but I think Bob would agree, and even the big guys, if they were here, he was kind of the center of things, and he seemed like to be the only one who was willing to cross that line and and uh, just, you know, I don't, I, I'd hate to say that the old man had any respect for you, but, but he might have. If he was going to have any for anybody, it would have been for Paul. Yeah, because Paul could take on dad in a more one on one fashion. I avoided that guy. Yeah, yeah that, pretty clear. And, and, and yeah. the stories that you tell of the physical abuse are pretty good. That would be a good reason to do that. But at the same time, at some point, you somebody had to say something. And, and each one of your own story arcs with your father, it seems, you each took a moment, including Billy, who did it in a very unproductive way, perhaps, but um, that, to stand up to him, to stand up to your dad, was seem, seemingly kind of a rite of passage in the family. Well, Bill was very brave. And, you know, when, when you're growing up in the business and your family becomes the business and, you know— you're basically the application at home is a military type of environment where they're going to apply what we learned in the military to the family of seven kids and six sons and all that business. And, and the way it was raised was to make sure the business succeeded. So you didn't have anything get in the way of the business. And so there was a circle around us through our career that isn't there now, which is why today this tour we're on the Happy Together Tour, that circle's gone, of course. And we enjoy this tour 
a thousand times better than any tour we ever had <laughs> back in the day at the we, councils because of what you're talking about now. They, there was just a ring around us. No one could get in, and we couldn't get out. And now well, that's it. We're having so much fun out here on this Happy Together Tour because we're finally getting to meet people that, you know, our dad would make sure we never met any of these groups we were playing with because we were kids and we were just swept away. And now we get to meet all these great artists that we were contemporaries with at the time, but we never met them. And like, hung out with them. And, and yeah. were accepted by them on, on a... We were kind of always the red-headed stepchildren yeah. of, of, our, of our generation, A, because... A, A, because we were 10 years younger than everybody. And I, there was a little bit of, a tiny bit of, of resentment from the older guys that these guys, uh, even our one of our bosses, Howard Kalin, very gently when I asked him why, why were we kind of, you know, shunned, he said, well, Suzu, you know, we'd all been working. We were in our 20s, and we'd been working hard at our careers, and we're finally on the charts, and here come these kids. Right. <laughs> Go up, <laughs> pick us off the chart, and 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 it just it pissed us off. He goes, you yeah. know what the worst part was? You guys were so damn good. Yeah, you know, and that made him mad. So you know, it's like, but I got to tell you something, Anne. That is it, so interesting to me. Often, you know, when when we're we're talking about the our documentary, which I love and I'm so proud of and honored to have been a part of, and it has helped a lot of people. And that, for me, was my reason for doing it. But it's fun because, like, so many years later, I'm like, wow, right, the documentary, the whole story, and I'm, like, trying to tap into it right now. And it's, it's just interesting. And, and it, <clears throat> I would like to know, had you seen it before? Or is, yeah. did you see it when you were kind of fixing to talk to it? Oh, no, no, no. No, I've seen it. I've been watching it for a couple years anyway. And I found it... Um, you know, I I used to look, I, mean, I used to go I, and I'm going to be playing some clips here, but I mean I used to love to. What well, here's what I really loved. I loved when you were doing the Sullivan show, and I thought I love to go see bands from the '60s that can actually play their instruments, because too much of it was right was done out of L.A., which is still cool, but it was like it's still I I really love to see people who can really play and sing live. And so I was delightfully uh, uh, impressed by your abilities on some of those early videos that I saw. And that's when I sort of started doing a deep dive on you all a long time ago. And we do a lot of pop culture stuff on Friday nights. And then I just I was sort of tripping on you guys anyway. And then I found that that documentary and I made my wife watch it. And I'm like, you got to see this. And she'd been hearing me talking about you all for years. So she was she we both. I think everybody I've talked to who's a, a fan of real solidly produced pop music also loves it. Well, that you know. So, Ian, that is absolutely correct. And we have a brand new album that's coming out oh, cool. on September 30th with Omnivore Records, and it's called Rhythm of the World. And, and you're going to love it because uh, if you like the councils, then this is... This is an incredible oh, album, yeah. and we did everything ourselves, produced it, wrote it. We wrote, actually, most of the songs out here on tour the past six years. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I will, and I, and I really do enjoy your solo work, and I, 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 I saw, I mean, I would go see the Beach Boys again, but I'm pretty sure I saw them with your brother John on, on the drums that, the night that I saw them. Um, Johnny Boy's over with the Beach Boys. Johnny Boy's been a Beach Boy Wow, 20, 23 years. Yeah, 23 right. years she's been drumming. And, you know, that was a career move for John. And I'm, who doesn't want to sing Beach Boy songs all the time? He was on the Grammys, wasn't he? Yeah. John? Yeah. With the Beach Boys, yeah. Well, yeah. He was also on the Full House. Well, yeah. But that's really all of those things. But this is part of what I'm going to get to. You all were on every TV show in America yeah, in the 1960s, too. So, I mean, go, run through the list, Bob, if you would, of all of the shows that you remember being on. And you, well, you don't have to do all of them, but like, give give us a, like the top ten. Now, you guys jump in, ready? Okay. okay, okay. Here we go. Merv Griffin, Mike Douglas, Johnny Cash, Jonathan Winters, John, uh, uh, the Crap Music Hall, Ed Sullivan, Johnny Carson, Johnny Carson, Mike Douglas, The Today Show. Ed good, Sullivan, did we say Ed Yeah, Sullivan? Good Morning America. Barbara and, McNair. Barbara McNair. Um, uh, uh, music scene. 
scene with the guy from <laughs> David Senate. Stein. Jonathan, David Stein. Stein. Or am I tri- um, Playboy After Dark. Playboy yeah. After Dark. Uh, <laughs> it's true. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, wait, there's more. And, anyway, and here's the deal, Ian. Seriously, we are so grateful for TV shows because, number one, back then, there was two ways to see your group, live right. or television. That's right. it. That was, or, or in a teen mag. Now, True. because we're the family band and mom's in the group, we, the teen mags love us and these TV shows love us. And thank God, because we have great videos and from those so shows. so much fun. So much fun. And we knew we were fortunate to be asked to be on so many TV shows. I mean, Ed Sullivan loved us. He gave us a 10-show contract, the biggest ever, even bigger than Beatles. Now, we only did it twice because Dad got in a fight with his son-in-law, Bob Precht, on the second so show. So stupid. And Ed took eight shows <laughs> away. He got mad at us. But we did have 10 for a while there with Ed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, well, and, and that's such a great, typical show business story. That's another thing I like about the Cow Sill story is that – you this you know the business of show right and so even in coded ways that you don't go into greater detail on i get it like a lot of people i know kind of been around the business for a long time fantastic up next a couple people that were involved in ian's career join us on coast to coast am alan corbeth along with art bell made coast to coast am what it is today a monster program they created it they pushed it, and they developed it, and he's on the line with us right now. Alan, thank you for joining us. Hey, George. It's uh, so good to hear this show. Thanks so much uh, for doing this uh, uh, tribute to Ian. He sure deserved it. He sure did. How did you find him in the first place? I don't remember. I'm, I'm thinking back how we did it. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it started probably in about 1998, and somebody recommended him. And uh, when he did the show... Uh, I really liked it because he he kind of had a very unique, uh, laid back way of doing it. He was very smart and very well informed, uh, and just came off as a, as a real nice guy. And it wasn't hard for him to come off as a nice guy because that's exactly what he was—one of the nicest people uh, you would have ever met anywhere. And when you were with him and chatting with him, uh, he just uh, relaxed everything and just really made you feel great. And uh, underneath all that was an incredible intellect uh so it just worked out very well as you well know absolutely i remember that day you had me fill in for him for the first time and after the program he called me up he used to call me gn ellen and he said gn you did a great job next time don't do such a good job <laughs> yeah that sounds like him he always had a, a terrific sense of humor to go up, to go along with everything else you know it, it, just to give you an example what a a terrific guy he was. Uh, there was there was a time we had a guest on who who will remain uh, uh, nameless at this point, but he was troublesome in the fact that nothing worked. Um, his telephone line was no good. Uh, his cell line was no good, uh, and it just was uh, a, an incredible hassle uh, that I ended up having to deal with. Uh, and we ultimately got it all figured out, and uh, the show went fine. And uh, there you go. However, at the end of uh, of the show, uh, the guest was thanking everybody, um, from uh, from the mailman to uh, the UPS driver, anybody he could think of, and he listed off about uh, 20 people, and he left me out of it. Now, that doesn't matter. Uh, it, it, I would have totally forgot about it, except here's where Ian comes in. Um, you know, I've had enough accolades in my life that I don't have to, uh, to worry about that. But at the end of it all, Ian, uh, Ian says uh, thanks again, and I really want to thank Alan for all the things that he did. Oh, and that's, that's just great. the kind of guy that he was. He was, he was just, just a terrific, terrific, very, very, very nice person. He sure was. Alan, thank you for being this. And our executive producer, Lisa Lyon, worked with Ian quite a bit, and she wrote the obit in the Coast to Coast website on Ian, and that's got to be the toughest thing you've ever done, Lisa. Uh, typos and all through my tears. It was really um, uh, uh, shocking news, and it's still shocking. It's left a huge void. But for 24 years, I got the privilege of being in the orbit of Planet Ian, and he was an amazing guy and so much fun to work with. And what you hear on the air is very much what he was like dealing with him one-on-one. You know, when the phone would ring, I'd say, that it was Ian Punnett, and, oh, yeah, I get to talk to Ian, and, and <laughs> it's everything that you could imagine. 
He was one of a kind, and you did a great job with him, Lisa. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for participating and listening to the program. It truly is important to all of us. One of Ian's favorite guests, Jason the Horse. Listen to this. You've been on the bean lately because, uh, uh, you know, after this possibility came up of us being able to get you back on the air, I'll be honest with you and say I was very excited. I, I for y- literally years after your appearance, people are coming up going, tell me about your feelings about the guy who said he was a horse. And 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 I think they had the same feeling I did. They were struck overwhelmingly with your sincerity. They knew that you weren't trying to pull my leg, but they weren't sure where you were on the sanity spectrum. That you know that, and they want to know like how I felt about that. Do you want do you want to address that up front? Well, um, I remember from the, the show that we did a couple of years ago, I think most of the – there were a couple of people who were out, just outright detractors, which I expected, and I, you know, they did not offend me. And uh, I'd say most of the other people seemed to be uh, you know, interested in at least hearing what I had to say, at least entertaining the possibility that, there might, that it might be partially or even completely correct. Right, right. And, uh, and so uh, I, I hope that it goes as well tonight as it did in our previous conversation. So thank you again for giving this uh, opportunity to us. And we'll give his email out, address out a little bit later on, too, for people if you want to be able to write it down. So, Jason, um, it, we, let, let's lay the, the groundwork down a little bit on how long you know you've been a horse and how do you – perceive that you have a horse soul how is it that you think of that as opposed to just being a guy with a really good imagination well beginning from when i was about one and a half to two years old i began remembering things like the first thing i remembered which happened was when i was about one and a half or two years old i was in the car with my my mother and father in downtown miami and I saw a billboard for the old BOAC, the old British uh, Overseas uh, Air Carrier. And, of course, I couldn't read the logo at the time, but you know, being an adult, now I can remember its distinctive shape and the lettering. And the photograph on the billboard showed a picture of the English countryside. There were no horses in the picture, but you, know, you could see the, the rolling farmland with the fields and the stone, the stone uh, fences and the hedgerows and lanes cutting through it. And just looking at that, I suddenly, it was like a movie started playing in my head where I was a huge sired draft horse trotting down the left side of the road pulling a, pulling a two-wheel cart full of hay, and I felt completely content and happy in that. And I, I, my parents didn't even understand what was going on. They kept looking at me because I kept staring at the billboard. But, of course, at that tender age, I couldn't even speak to express what I was experiencing. And And so... <sighs> That's your first memory of your perception that that you felt this connection to what it would be to be a horse. But how how is it that you define a horse soul so that we understand that you are that it's even possible that you that you don't have a human soul, but that you have the the life um, you know force of of an animal creature inside this you know human shell that you walk around in. Well, over the years, in my experiences with horses, about 20% of horses have recognized me as a fellow horse, and they have treated me as one of their own kind. That includes being challenged by stallions and even on occasion having been propositioned by mares, and it has resulted in me being treated both better and worse than a human being would be by a horse because realizing that I am one of them, they expect me to abide by the normal herd protocols and rules of behavior and includes you know, challenging you know, to, see, you know, to see what my pecking order within the herd would be, and I have to you know, establish boundaries with them to show you know, what, where I am in the herd. And on occasion, I have had to take over control of the herd, so to speak, you know, to, to, to impress upon them that I'm the highest-ranking herd leader, especially when I've been challenged by a herd leader so that I wouldn't be intimidated or possibly physically even threatened. Right. Okay. I'm going to still push you on this. So you, that's, that's how you live it out. And that's the feedback that you get, you believe, from other horses. But, um, you know, as, as we were talking about last hour, sometimes we project onto animals those emotions that we think they should have or that we think that they're experiencing when they may or may not be. Um, how, how can you define, how can you f- understand your horseness? as it were, as opposed to just being a guy with a vivid imagination. I mean, is there, how is that, how, are there any other clues 
that this is a real experience you're having as a horse, not just a convincing guy with an uh, amazing delusion? Mm-hmm. That is an excellent question. Well, I have to say we do, our two peoples do share a lot of similarities, so it wouldn't be surpri- surprising that there would be things that would appear to be in common between our two peoples. But I guess it would, uh, it would manifest itself in me as there are certain things that humans are supposed to like and want that uh, have, have never occurred to me at all. For example, uh, the notion of, of, of chasing after wealth. I've never, I've never done that, though I've never wanted to be, you know, poor, you know, dirt poor either. And also, um, uh, I'm trying to think of some things like um, – uh, and, and achieving high status, things like that. I'm not saying that I'm uh, what you would call someone, or what's the terminology, someone who would just be a slacker either, but they were going for that. And also the fact that real that as, as horses, when we deal with each other, there's more than one mind in play here. It's not only our own individual minds, but also there is a herd mind and a species mind. And human beings tend to be discrete, enclosed units that uh, are just are more or less autonomous beings who work with each other. Of course, there are those who do, like I'm sure you've been in situations where you've met certain individuals and it's like you click with them or if you're in a group of people, it's right. like suddenly so much more gets done or, or so many more ideas are expressed, almost like a, a fertility of ideas erupts forth. And that happens with me with horses where it, uh, very, it doesn't happen very often or if at all with human beings. And that's how I know that I connect with them. Uh, so, so when you're, you're a young child, this is your first time that you think that you have these memories recalled actual memories, as opposed to imagined scenarios of a past life as a, as a horse, uh, as a Blackshire horse, right? Is that the breed that you are? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and these, uh, and these memories start coming more often. Talk about your life, your human life, the, the, the timeline of your human life as you began to understand your inner hoarseness. Okay. I was born in 1966. I'm 42 years old now. And these things started to happen, like I said, at about one and a half to two years of age. When I was three years old, I it was the first time I ever saw a horse in person. I was at my brother Bob's house, and we heard the clip-clop of horses' hooves outside went out on the sidewalk, and there were a group of hippies who had been out riding their horses some distance away earlier in the day, and they were riding back down Miller Road towards an area of South Dade County called Horse Country, and that was the first time I had uh, ever ever seen a horse in person, and more importantly, the first time I had ever smelled a horse, and now, it's, of course, it's possible I'd seen a horse on television before that, because we had television, but when I when I caught the first caught the scent of those horses, something suddenly clicked, or I suddenly wanted to run and be with them. I re- it's like I really realized these are my people. These are the ones I belong with. And I felt a longing so powerful that it's like the, the sense of longing that C.S. Lewis spoke of, the German word sensuk, to the blue flower of longing, I believe it's called. And ever since then, I've known that, uh, that I am one of them. It's a slight irony to hearing you say you saw some horses and you said, these are my people. Uh, I understand what you're saying, but they, that they that they would look at you though and somehow that they you feel like even as a child they began to respond to you as a fellow horse not at that time it was some years later before i had a chance to spend any time with a horse up close in person that was about let's see 1979 was the first time by that time we moved up to northern georgia it was the first time i was ever actually able to do much riding and there was one mare in particular I rode. Uh, she, had, she had no name. I just, I just gave her the name Lucy because, like the character in the Peanuts comic strip, she was very forceful while, while, not, uh, while it didn't diminish her, their femininity at all. And uh, she was you know, a rather high-ranking herd, herd member. And she treated me as, as a whore, mare would treat a foal. And I always felt like a foal in her presence. And the odd thing was she was only about six years old, but she always seemed so much older and wiser to me. I felt – that's why I, I just felt like a young foal in her presence as if she was protecting me. Is it, and you believe that in, in – at least in your case, this is uh, – you are – you experience a, a kind of reincarnation. You, you, you have – been a, a a horse and now your soul has been passed on to a human body do you think it's a mistake that you're in a human body no actually it was a job that i agreed to i was not sent to this but i was i and several other several other horses were asked to do this and by our, the horse ancestors which a term that does not originate with me it was that term was originated by linda kohano who wrote a book called the Tao of equus but we were asked to do this in order to facilitate a closer connection and relationship between our two peoples, because our two peoples 
our companion races were meant to be together. Uh, in this case, the horses and human beings, that, that horses and human beings have been together for so long that you're here to help try to continue to foster good relations? Well, to bring us our, bring our relationship to a higher level. We did How, make, what would that mean, a higher level? Well, we did make possible the human rise of technological civilization. I mean, it's not bragging when it's true. We did make, you know, make that possible by our, our strength and ability to carry things and human beings over greater distances than humans can travel on foot. But uh, until, until relatively recent years, we were treated, although many treated us kindly, we were treated essentially as beasts of burden and as beautiful but rather stupid animals. And, uh, and it has been, has been demonstrated in the last few decades, we can actually work with human beings to help you to do things. There are certain things that we can do better than you and, of course, many things that you can do better than we can. One thing that we do is we use emotions as information. That's why we're so helpful in, in certain fields such as equine-facilitated psychotherapy and equine experiential learning because using emotions as information, we can perfectly mirror emotions, even repressed and hidden emotions in human beings. In other, in other words, we can help you to right. remember or reclaim your humanness, so to speak. Uh, and so in, in a past horse life, how did you how did you die? Well, it's interesting you asked that because just a, a couple of Mondays ago, I was shown something that, um, well, all the time, you know, the people who know me, friends of mine, have always said, oh, Jason, you ought to be hypnotically regressed to see where you were and what you did. You know, you might have been you know, a royal stud or something like that. But I always had this gnawing feeling that any, that I might experience something or things that were very unpleasant to relive. And from what I'd read about past life regression, when you are, go through it, you are reliving it as if it's happening at this moment. You know, right. It really brings it into the present time. Right. And a couple of Mondays ago, I've been working for the last couple of years to write this book. And for the last eight months or so, I just could not get anything down on paper or, on, or in my case, on the computer. And I'd gotten to a point where I just was, was, was just, would just stare out the window, and it was just like nothing would come. I mean, like the ultimate writer's block. And a couple of Mondays ago, the weekend before that, I was so in such a, a funk about it. I just, I just kind of moped around the house, did not sleep, uh, ate very little. And on early Monday morning, I sat down in my chair, tried to get some sleep, and sleep just would not come to me. And every time I would, I would get to a point where I would start to nod off, there would be this loud buzzing in my head. And from what I've read, that's the precursor to an out-of-body experience. I tried for over an hour to get to sleep, and this buzzing kept, kept occurring. And so finally I figured, well, I'm not going to get to sleep until this happens, whatever it is. So, well, here it goes. Whatever happens, happens. So I just sat back in the chair and allowed it to happen. And and the next thing I knew, I was I was in a place somewhere in Europe, I think northern Europe, because it seemed to be a cool, temperate climate, where I was walking up a, a roughly cut road up a very steep hillside, almost with an almost vertical drop off, and to the side I could see two sets of arches of a Roman aqueduct, and I was a workhorse being you know, taken up the hill either to carry tools or materials, possibly the stones, and the the two sets of un- incomplete arches. Uh, they, they, they attracted my attention, and I turned my head and neck to look at them. And at that point, the roadway under my hoof on the right side crumbled. And I fell, just, I mean, just screaming, kick, kicking, gesticulating wildly, and slammed hard into the ground right in the middle of the works below where there were some stones, and just continuously screaming. And, you know, they always say in dreams that if you, you, know, if you don't wake up before you, you hit, you die. Well, I hit and died, was still screaming. And the next thing I knew, I was being led through a green, a green pasture, by a, 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 a rather swarthily complected man with black hair and a beard where it looked like homespun, uh, leading me silently by the halter. And it was in this place uh, where the, the grass was being illuminated by a tremendously bright white light coming from above, although there did not seem to be, there seemed to be no light source. It was just blue sky above, but the grass was lit by a light that was so bright that you would think it would be blinding. Yet looking at it, I could, I could look at it, and I felt almost as if I were slightly sedated. Then he patted me and walked, walked away. And around there was it was almost like a, it was like a paddock, but the trees surrounding it were in, in, were were obscured by a mist or fog. 
and the impression I got was it was some kind of holding area or transition area with the newly dead or taken animals or horses, I suppose, to, to acclimate to their new circumstances. And after standing there for a few months, I also felt puzzlement that I could see in color because, you know, in my natural form, we don't perceive colors the way humans do. For example, green appears to us as white appears to you all. You know, grass and, and leaves appear white. And I was puzzled by that. The next, the next thing that happened, I was sitting in this form in a room looking out through a window with the curtains slightly parted. And, uh, and a, 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 a nonverbal message in my mind said, it was a message from my people, from the horse ancestors, we understand the misery that you're undergoing. If you wish to return to us, you may do so now. Simply think it and you will be with us again. In other words, I was given the choice, think the thought, and I would, in this form, die. And I thought just for a moment, I thought of a couple of friends of mine uh, who, for whom would be sad, and if I suddenly left and I decided, no, not now. And the next thing I knew, I, I was bolt awake, and after that, I was able to sleep normally. I kind of uh, trembled for the few hours, you know, for a few minutes after that because it was such a profound experience. But uh, I also felt better because I realized that I'm welcome any time. Although I would like to finish this task before I do go back, whenever that is. Goodbye, Ian Punnett. For Dan Galanti, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Ladasur, Stephanie Smith, Chris Burroughs, Tim Banal, George Knapp, Richard Serrett, and Ian Punnett. I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.